All right, we're going back to James chapter 5. <laughs> I had a pastor friend, his, his name was Sheely. I don't know, Brother Johnson, if you remembered Daryl Sheely from Fairmont. Uh, he said that he worked as a car salesman for about three years. He said he would not recommend it. <laughs> But he worked for a car salesman for about three as a three for about three years, and there was across from the dealership there was a diner, and so all the salesmen would walk over and they would sit down and wait for the next victim to wander on the lot, the, and then they would take their turns. So they were sitting there sipping coffee and talking, and they, one of them looked over and says, "There he is again." And Brother Sheely said, who? And he said, that old man wanders on the lot every couple of days or so. And uh, no one moved. No one got up. So Brother Sheely said, well, can I go talk to him? He said, well, it's your time to waste. You know, he wasn't dressed very well. And an older gentleman. Not that that age matters, but... So he walked over there and walked up to the man and said, Sir, may I help you? He said, Yes, I would like to purchase a used car. He said, We have several on the lot. That was back in the days when they were on the lot. <laughs> several on the lot. What kind were you looking for? And he told him and he took him over and showed him the ones. And the guy looked at one and he said, uh, I kind of like this one right here. Uh, well, would you like to take it out for a chest drive? He said, No, that won't be necessary. And he said, right, okay, then let's go inside. We'll write it up and get you to the cashier. And he took him in, rolled it up, took him to the cashier, came out. And he said that we can have this car ready for you in a couple hours. You know, we'll sweep it out. We'll give it a good washing and all that. He said, that, that will be fine. He left. So Brother Sheely wanders back over to the diner and sits down. And they were all kind of chuckling, you know. He said, well, what do you want? He said, you want to buy a car. I just sold him one that showed him that one over there. And their mouths almost hit the table. Sometimes we are, uh, we're not wise sometimes in looking at a person and judging who, their character by what they have on. And we need to be careful of that, don't we? You know, Jesus loved all men. He would go to places no one else would go to. He would be with the sick and infirmed. He even called a publican to be one of his disciples. He wandered into Samaria to talk to a woman at a well that was hated by her contemporaries. And yet he was able to uh, win her. And she went back and made a tremendous difference in the city of Sychar, wasn't she? So we have to be careful of that. And that's why the first uh, three verses of James chapter 5, that's why he warns about just because a person dresses a certain way doesn't necessarily mean that that's what that person is. There was another occasion, I don't remember who told me that this man wandered on, came on the lot of a car salesman and bibbed overalls and he's flannel shirt was pretty well torn and uh, you know kind of rough looking and he walked in the door and walked up and and uh, said you know I'd like to purchase a car one of the salesmen came and said well yes sir we have some around the back you know sitting back by the back gate probably uh, more in your price range he said no I don't want to go back there I want this one right here and that salesman just kind of stunned you know well the manager, sales manager, heard all this going on. He come walking out and interrupted the salesman and spoke to the buyer and said, yes sir. Yes sir, we will certainly get that wrote up for you and we will take care of it. And they took him to the cashier and that man pulled out a wad of money and paid for the car in cash. Right there. Uh, you know, and of course after the man left, the sales manager called the, the other salesman over and he said, don't you ever do that again. You do not care what a person looks like. If they're wanting to, to buy a car, then you let them buy it. 
let the finance company handle the money part. You're here to sell it. You're not here to judge what a person can have or not have. So, you know, there are folk who may not be dressed very well, but is it not true that they could be a very good character, couldn't they? There was a church that called a man to come in view of a call. He was dressed very modestly, a black suit, a white shirt, and a thin black tie. And he spoke in the morning and, spoke, and talked to them and spoke that evening, and they called him as their pastor. His first Sunday there, he came walking in with eight children in tow. And all, the, all of the, the, some of the men of the church going, oh my goodness, how are we going to support this huge family? And one of the men said, Pastor, why did you have eight kids? He said, because I didn't want nine. <laughs> was his answer. And by, you know, by his appearance, and even with his eight kids, they were clean, they were dressed well. Uh, Brother Larry will remember there was a couple of little girls that used to come here that uh, they, were, they were, didn't have the best of everything, but they were always clean, they were always uh, well-groomed, you know. We have to be careful because it's not what we have that makes us who we are. It's the Lord Jesus Christ that makes us who we are. Hold your finger here in James, and let's go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. This man is asking the Lord, I'm going down to verse number 15, but this man asks the Lord to speak to his brother because he's not sharing the inheritance. And in verse 14, and he said unto him, Man, who made thee a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto, him, unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not of the abundance, the abundance of things which he possesseth. What we have does not make us who we are. Okay? It's a good verse to mark in your Bible, by the way. So we have to be careful. And number two, is it not true that everything we have is riddled with corruption? Nothing. Nothing we have lasts forever. I think a couple of Sundays ago I mentioned about having shoes older than my kids. <laughs> that's that's, that's really, not really true. Okay. Uh, how many of you remember when mothers would have their baby's shoes bronzed, put them on a stand, had a picture of the baby behind them? Nothing lasts forever, does it? Our houses have to be worked on. Perry told me one time that he decided after 25 years to have some work done to his barn. Thought it was time. <laughs> There's always something needs fixing or change, doesn't it? It's the way life is. We've been replacing batteries here, dealing with lights. And here pretty soon, is it not what, middle of September? Last part, when is the time change? coming and they suggest that you replace batteries. You know, they want to they want to make a car that runs by batteries while they run coal furnaces at the power plant in order to produce electricity. Now you well, you put that out, right? But nothing lasts. Okay? Nothing lasts. Things wear out, they change. And anyone who places their trust in such things is going to be disappointed, isn't it? Okay, they're going to be disappointed. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew 
Down to verse number 19, lay, lay not up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, but lay for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Everything on this planet rust corrodes. You know, I uh, antique cars. I like antique cars. But I like them restored like they were in the showroom. If they put big wide tires on them and jack them up and have the motor sticking out the hood and stuff like that, that don't appeal to me. But if it looks like it came, came out of the showroom, that to me is a good uh, restoration job. One time I saw a 57 Chevrolet. And that was my brother's first car. He uh, jacked the back of it up so high that I could, it was almost here to me. The bumper was about here on me. And uh, Mom and Dad decided to use his car to go to town for something. And I laughed seeing Mom and Dad in that car up and down like that. That was funny. Well, of course, he got stopped. And the officer told him, you can't I'll have your car up that high. Someone could hit your gas tank and cause an explosion. So he had to put it back down. And he had that car for a little while. Then he got rid of it and got something else. But everything, you know, there's nothing that lasts forever. Okay? Nothing lasts forever. Now, granted, some of the changes that we have seen in recent years has been good changes. Good changes. Had a crock pot. We got our first crock pot and, those, it, and it didn't come apart. The inside is all one and I had to hold it over the sink and reach up in there and try to scrub it out. And now they got the kind that the insides come out and you can put in a dishwasher for that matter. And that, that is, that's a good change, isn't it? But still, things wear out. It, they, you know, they're not going to last forever. And the danger of trusting in things that corrupt is that they will never, never last as long as you think they will. Let's go to Isaiah chapter number 55. Isaiah chapter number 55. And as the uh, people, the entrepreneurs would come into the market area and set up their wares and then they would start calling out. I mean, you remember going to the fair and uh, three balls for a dollar to knock down something, get a stuffed animal or something, and they're, they're hollering out, trying to get people's attention to come over and uh, try, their, try to uh, win something. Well, that's this word in verse number one, ho, everyone that thirsteth. That's, that's the same thing as he's, they're calling out. Okay, and Isaiah is calling out, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Notice verse 2, wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? Why are you buying unnecessary things? Bread's, uh, bread's necessary, isn't it? Okay. And your labor for that which satisfieth not, hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Why are you laboring at things that just will not last? We understand that everything in this world is temporary. Nothing is permanent. But only those things which we have done for God will last through the judgment of God. And that's kind of what he's talking about here in the first three verses of James chapter 5 and reminding us that uh, one day that this place is going to be set on fire. 
Okay, and now look at verse number four. I'm back in Job chapter five, looking at verse number four. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. What can a poor person do against a rich person? When they, the word fraud, they agree to pay them a certain amount and then decide, no, I won't do that. Okay? Remember the occasion when Jesus was saying that a man hired laborers, he hired uh, men at the beginning of the day, he, and he offered to pay them a certain amount. Well, then came some fellows as toward the end of the day, and he said he would pay them the same as those who had labored all day, and they were saying, hey, that's not fair. And then he said, well, you men have been here all day, you agreed to this amount. And what you agreed to has nothing to do with those who came in later. So, uh, whenever men would gather for work and they would go into the fields to labor, they worked hard through the day's course and expected to be paid. And you know what? The Lord expected them to be paid fairly too. And so they defrauded, they kept back part of the money. And the, and the harvesters are saying, wait a minute. What can we do? Well, he reminds them that the Lord has ears. <laughs> he has good ears, doesn't he? He has ears. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. Aren't you glad the Lord hears us? Well, I'm telling you, we'd be in a bad way if he didn't listen to us. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Of course, we all know verse 14. Well, notice verse 15 of 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attent unto the prayers that are made in this place. That's great, isn't it? When someone would come before the Lord to lay their petition, they knew he was telling them, I am listening. I hear what you have to say. All right? Sometimes as parents we get busy with things and uh, the day goes by so fast and then your child comes and says, Daddy, I need to ask you something and your mind is full of a thousand things and uh, so you have to learn to stop and sit down and say, okay, what you got? What, what do you need? Because uh, we, we get too busy sometimes and we need to be careful about listening. Well, I'm glad the Lord listens. When we bow in prayer, He listens. He knows and He listens. I'm going to take you all the way back to the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter number 4. The Word of God is alive, isn't it? And it's powerful, isn't it? Sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even the dividing of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the faults and intents of the heart. You know, we might, can, we probably can hide things from people, even relatives, even family. But it's certain we cannot hide things from the Lord, can we? Notice verse number 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open under the eyes of him 
with whom we have to do. Okay? He sees it all. In fact, He knows what's coming our way before we know what's coming our way. Oftentimes, He allows things to come our way for the express purpose of a test. What decision will we make? We may not know until the, the situation presents itself, but the Lord knows what our choice will be. Now, if we make a poor, we make an unwise choice, we may have to walk that street again. But the purpose is He's trying to get us to learn. To learn. Okay? But He sees all. He knows all. He hears all. In Isaiah chapter 44, he was telling them, why are you praying to a piece of wood <laughs> that cannot hear, that cannot speak, that cannot do anything for you? Okay? You cut the thing down, you shape it like a, the God you want to worship, and you clean up the shavings, and you take it in your house and pitch it in your your fire pit to cook your food with. What kind of God is that? Okay? Well, we don't, you know, God doesn't need us to take care of Him. We need Him to take care of us. He's God. He's always been God. He was God before I came into this world. And if, I'm, if He does not come before I leave this world, He's still God. Okay? So be careful. Be honest in our dealings. Because the Lord knows. The book of Galatians. Book of Galatians. I go to chapter 6. not deceived. God is not mocked. Everyone know what verse that is, right? For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap what? Corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit capital S, shall of the Spirit, capital S, reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary while doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I, uh, well, Brother Johnston, we like to see results, don't we? We like to see results. We like to know that uh, I'm doing where I'm, what I'm doing and that I'm where I'm supposed to be and God is blessing. We like to see results. But sometimes that doesn't happen. There are sometimes the Lord's giving results in areas that we cannot see. But He didn't tell us to be successful. He said be faithful. Be faithful in our work. So let's be careful. Ephesians chapter Number six. And let's go down. Oh, we'll start with verse number nine. Ephesians chapter six. And ye masters, 
do the same things unto them, forbearing threatenings, knowing that your master also, which also is in heaven, neither is the respect of persons with him. <laughs> he was telling them, that, now you masters, you house owners, you treat your people right. Okay? You treat your people right. Wasn't there a thing that a slave could ask of the elders in, so that he would serve his master of his own volition the rest of his life? Everybody remember what that was? They would put a hole in his ear. Now it wasn't like an earring kind of hole, but it was, a, it was like an auger, wasn't it? That they would push through that ear. And that meant that he would be that man's servant for the rest of his life. He said, I love my master. I don't want to leave him. Okay? Now, that is a, that is a wonderful testimony for any master, isn't it? When people want to serve him. I one time spoke with a doctor and uh, I was kind of curious because, you know, some, some, of, some places they kind of go through help a lot. So I asked him, how, I said, your nurse, how long has she been with you? Oh, she's, she's the youngest one. She's been here for 25 years. <laughs> well, that's an excellent testimony for an employer that your people are still with you. They're treated right. And when you do those kind of things, you get known that you treat your people right. You get known that, you're, that they're going to get a fair shake from you. And the Lord is honored by that. Because you see, we have a master in heaven. And he is watching. He sees all. And if we try to pull something that's not godly or Christian or of a good testimony, he sees that and it would damage us as far as our ability to serve others. So, you better watch out. The Lord of the Sabbath is watching. And he sees and he knows Okay, and I didn't tell you when we started, but back in James chapter 5, I'm going to hit one more verse here. Have you ever noticed people that <laughs> they have a bunch of stuff, but ne they never seem to be content? happy with it. Went to a computer store many, many, a long time ago. And I told the clerk what I had. I had a, a IBM computer with no hard drive and a five and a quarter floppy disk. He said, well, you've got a very nice paperweight. That's what you got. And uh, I remember, and I remember in a computer store, I remember looking over there and I saw $2,000 on a desktop computer. Remember whenever they would, what was it? Wasn't the government, didn't the government spend like $4 million on a computer that filled an entire floor of a building? You know, and that, that computer that filled that entire floor of that building is probably sitting on your desk laptop. But anyway, well, you know, obviously that wasn't going to work. Someone said, you need to go to this flea market. There's a guy there that has discs and he might even have a hard drive for you. So I went over there and sure enough, he had my first hard drive was a 10 meg hard drive. All right. We thought we were stepping in tall cotton, I'm telling you. And it had an operating system on it. He called it point and shoot. It was just little programs that you hit on it. And it would say execute and it would bring up a word processor. We were able to connect to the library in town to reserve books if the girls needed a book for school. And we thought we were something else. We had a printer that you could, a dot matrix printer that you could print stuff off. Boy, what the you? It was something else. Well, you got, you know, you need to get rid of that and get you something better. It worked fine for us. 
What's the problem? Okay? My point of all this is sometimes what we have is just as good and does not need to be better. Okay? To be content with such you have, things as you have. And sometimes that's hard, but there's people out there that continually buy things, want more. They're never satisfied with what they have. They're always in a state of wanting. That's what's there in verse number five. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanting. You have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. They're, they're not content with what they have. Always something more. Okay? Everybody remember the 23rd Psalm, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. I won't need anything. I'm so grateful that we have a salvation that was paid in full. We don't have to do anything. Add to it, take away from it, we don't have to do anything. So they... They're, they're trying to gain more. They're trying to defraud people. And James is telling them, don't do that. Don't do that. You and I understand the Lord is not somebody you want to mess with and think that it will be passed. Okay? He can pour out blessings, can he? Numberless blessings. His presence, His peace. Great, great things. Just as surely as He can pour out His chastisement for disobedience. Let's be aware. You know, uh, the Bible is simple to read, but isn't it hard to follow? <laughs> so we need to be careful. All right? In verse number six, ye have condemned and killed the just. And he doth not resist you. That's bad, isn't it? I mean, treating people in such a fashion? Lord knows. What do you think? You think when Germany persecuted the Jews, pulled them into pits, and then finally the final solution was to take them to camps where they had furnaces and they would put them in those furnaces, had gas chambers. Do you think the Lord was turned his head away and said, okay? All right? Now, I don't mean this to sound political, but I have seen with my own eyes, I have seen our nation blessed when we honored Israel, and I have seen us suffer when we did not. Okay. There is a difference. Because those who bless Israel are blessed by Israel. Those who curse Israel are cursed because of Israel. That's the way it works. Okay. And then when they were arrested and taken to trial at Nuremberg, all they said was, we were following orders. Now I'm going to give you two things. Number one, when the world turns against the people of God, they're going to get in trouble for it. Okay, because God is on the throne. Okay. Number two, being a pastor, Brother Johnson and myself, we're just men. We have our flaws. We're not anything special. But we have been called to an office that the Lord asked to be respected. It concerns me when people do not respect the office in which a man holds. Okay? We had a visitor some time ago. He kept calling me by my first name. And that bothered me. That's why, you know, I like people to call me Pastor Bond. Okay? Now I'm not telling you, you know, this is us. You know, I'm not really particular what you call me as long as I get something to eat when you do. <laughs> but for strangers, people out there, people need to respect the office in which a man holds. 
I knew a pastor that got on top of the building and ate a plate of spaghetti because they had a certain number in Sunday school. I've heard of pastors getting splashed in the face with pies and such like. No, 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 no. That is not me. And that will I, I think I can speak for both of us. That's not us. We do not do that. And we'll not do such things. Okay? Because the office of pastor needs to be respected. What about those in Isaiah? What about those men who <laughs> laughed at Isaiah? Okay. And they got in some pretty serious trouble over it, didn't they? Whenever a prophet went before a king, that king sat up and take notice because that man was coming with the word of the Lord. And he knew he didn't harm him, didn't bother him because he knew that God was speaking to him through that prophet. And if he didn't pay attention, <laughs> it was going to be trouble. Okay? All right. Enough of that stuff. Let's stand.